In this video, we're talking power of sale, whether you're the borrower or the lender, I'm gonna cover all bases. We're gonna use an actual example with numbers based on the situation I know of that's local right here in the GTA. And we're gonna have feedback from Mark Morris, one of the top real estate lawyers here in the city of Toronto, who's gonna to walk us through the different steps of the power of sale process and how to handle it, whether you're the borrower or the lender. We're gonna talk about worst case, best case scenarios and the timeline and what you can do to protect yourself. Hi, my name is Vass and I'm a full-time real estate broker right here in the city of Toronto. I help families and investors navigate the chaos that we call the real estate market. Okay, so we're going to dive right into it. So I'll give you the hypothetical situation first. So let's assume this time last year at the peak, I bought a property for $1.3 million. I put $300,000 down. I got an $800,000 mortgage with a bank and I got a $200,000 private loan with a private lender, interest only one year. So now that loan is coming up for renewal. And what's happening is everybody's scared. My loan to value ratio right now is the property is worth a million dollars. So therefore I'm maxed out on the loan. So I'm no longer within their 80% loan to Got value. It. So with that as the backdrop and me being the borrower, my question, my question is as follows. So if I'm the borrower and I call you, what are my options and make the assumptions that I'm not able to get another private loan to replace the current one because I'm over the LTV and assume I don't have friends or family willing to let me borrow money. So I'm like the worst right. case scenario. Well, this isn't actually a hypothetical. This is happening across the board uh, everywhere. Mainly, by the way, if I may, just to bring it out of the hypothetical and into the practical, this is actually mainly happening in suburban markets, single detached suburban markets. Most people who have extended themselves and have purchased in Alliston, Ontario, and in Caledon, and in Markham, and have purchased uh, a either freehold or a townhouse product, and have vastly overextended themselves, and there's quite a few of them, are all finding themselves in the position of having market mortgages that uh, will not renew, even actually without the privates, mortgages that will not renew. And the reason for that has everything to do with well, the simple fact that market values have fallen drastically and your LTV isn't matched. Uh, this is, I, I'm just describing the problem first before we talk about what the, what the solution is. This is uh, made much worse by virtue of the fact that places like Mix are, 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 are suffering shrinking path capital pools, uh, by which I mean most of the people who were contributing to Mix in the first place were using their HELOCs or their home equities lines to do it, and those monies are dissipating as well. And as a result, what we're starting to see for the first time in this, what I think it's safe to say that it's a recession, even though that it hasn't been called officially yet, um, the beginning of this recessionary cycle saw higher interest rates, but no lack of liquidity. Now what we're seeing is the beginning of a lack of liquidity. And so what you're asking me directly, just to contextualize, is how the hell do we deal with liquidity in a falling market where LTV volume, volumes are falling? It doesn't matter if it's private. It doesn't matter if it's uh, a bank that needs to renew and then remortgage. Like all of them are going to be suffering from the same fate. The answer is really only one course. So you're either borrowing, but you're saying in this scenario you can't because you really want to play this out. And you want to say what happens. Your question is back is against the wall. What happens when back is against the wall? When there is no other avenue, there are no available lines of funding, and when you owe this money? Well, two things happen. First, you can try to negotiate with the private. By the way, that's not a silly thing to do. Because remember, the private lender has quite a bit on the line too. Like, let's play out the scenario that you talked about, okay? You purchase for 1.3, you have an $800,000 first, you have a $200,000 second. Value of the property, now falls to $1 million, just hypothetically. Okay, fine, we got it. Um, the total amount of extended money is pretty much 100% LTV. That's what's gone on. And as a result, if the first mortgage or the second mortgage engages in a power of sale proceedings, it's highly likely that that private mortgage company is going to be facing a loss because they simply aren't gonna recover enough money in order to make themselves whole. Oh, it is. Yeah, sorry, and perfect. So this is exactly, I just wanted to stop for a second but because I, we jumped one point that I really want to understand better. So right now, let's assume my more, my renewal or expiry of this one-year mortgage is for the second private is call it in 30 days. And they've told me they're not going to renew and I have my backs against the wall. Now, 
the negotiation part happens, but before I start negotiating with them, um, what if they sent me a notice that they want to proceed with the power of sale for me to like, I'm assuming that's the first, is that the first thing they're going to send me to tell no, me? That's, hey, not what happens. that's not what happens. That's not what happens. So I'll go through the whole process. Okay, so let's start there then, and then I'll, I'll I'll return to where we are. So the way a process works is that you have to abide by the terms of the mortgage. So up until the end of the year, so long as you keep making your payments, copacet, no problem. But if they're saying they're not going to renew, and if you go a day beyond that renewal point, well, then we have a problem. We have a problem because you're in breach of the mortgage terms, and thus power of sale proceedings can proceed. Let's talk about what happens during the power of sale period. During the power of sale period, a notice is provided to whoever the borrower is and their spouse, even if they don't have a spouse, but it will be provided. There's a reason for that legally, but who cares? That's not what you're asking about. And it then gives them 35 days, although practically 37 days, in order to cure the default. So in this case, curing the default would mean getting a mortgage to supplant them. And during those 35 or 37 days, a lawyer, uh, a mortgage company can do nothing. Nothing. They just have to sit back and wait. It is only after the 35 or 37 days have expired that they can then go ahead, obtain default judgment, because under the commitment of the mortgage sign, you have defaulted, and then secure a writ of seizure and possession. Oh. That is done with the sheriff's office. Okay, so what happens is, let's go through it again. First, you have a contract with the bank. The contract is fine, and then it goes into default. After default, notice is provided over to the uh, borrower, and default judgment is then obtained, or a trial is had. But usually it's default judgment because there's really no defense. Meaning that there's a judgment from the court stating that the commitment is invalid. This takes place pretty quickly. If I'm in this position where I'm getting this notice and I have 37 days and I know I'm not going to be able to do anything, would it then make sense for me to just try to list my house myself to try to sell it? Totally. Uh, totally. That's what, when you see a listing for a power of sale, sometimes it's the bank that's listing it. But sometimes you'll see an individual's name on it saying power of sale. And what they mean is that the 35 days are going forward. In other words, if we don't sell this by that 35th day, then the power reverts to the bank where they have the ability to go ahead and sell the property. Okay. Now, my follow-on question with this is that the confusion I've had is that I'm told if I'm a private and there's a, as, there's a bank with a first position on the property... There's technically an encumbrance, so they have to work with the bank to create this power of sale as the private lender. They can't just go and put it without, I guess, consent from the bank. I'm not sure. No, so they're absolutely allowed to institute a power of sale without the consent of the bank. But the bank has an obligation to take care, to be taken care of first. Okay, and got so it. And so the bank doesn't care. Okay, go ahead, do your power of sale. If you sell the house... You have to give me first money first. You're going to ask me straight out, do you actually have a payout statement? Because I need to pay you out before I can take a dime. That's the order of security. So even if that person is doing a power of sale, the bank is secured with its first position. Now, having said that, one of the reasons that secondary lenders like to work with first lenders is because upon triggering a power of sale, it's usually a technical violation of the first mortgage. And the first mortgage actually can then take recourse as well. And you don't want two wild cards. You want one person to organize the process. Part of what people have forgotten in providing secondary mortgages is that when you provide a secondary mortgage, you need the money to take out the first for this very reason. You don't want two wild cards, one with greater position than you, activating on default. You only want one. So generally, if the first mortgage is in default, then the secondary mortgage buys out that position, takes it over entirely. If the secondary mortgage is in default, then you want them to be able to control the process. Usually the first mortgagee doesn't care that much that there's a secondary power of sale because again, they're gonna, they're gonna see every single cent and every dollar. So the question then becomes, if you're in trouble, what do you do? Getting back to your original question. Well, in the scenario you've outlined, this is as much a problem for the borrower as it is for the second mortgagee. Mm. Because the second mortgagee has its own haircut to take 
once the sale takes place. Now, it's true that the second mortgagee may be very willing to do it. They might just say, screw it, it's 50,000 bucks, I don't care. Like, just let's move, <laughs> let's, let's get this done. I don't give a crap about this. I don't wanna deal with this person anymore. I'm just taking a loss on my investment and we're gonna go. But more likely than not, particularly if there's more money at stake, they're ready to deal. Perhaps they will continue to extend a mortgage for another year at higher or more onerous terms in the hopes that the market changes around because they themselves have their tail along the line. One train of thought is that actually trying to kick the can down the road with the second position private is actually a potential strategy. And what, basically what you said as negotiation is what I referred to as doing this exactly. It is negotiation. And the lenders, by the way, will negotiate. They will only negotiate if they don't have self-help remedies. So the whole idea behind a mortgage is that it's a self-help remedy. It's something you can do yourself to just enforce and get back your money. But that only works if there's available money in the property. And if there isn't, then they are simply a negotiation partner. Now, no lender wants to be in a negotiation partner with a borrower. But then again, no borrower wants to be in a position where their property value falls 40%. But here we are. And as a result, we're now in the position of actual negotiation. I was dealing with a file yesterday. It was a $10 million file. And there was $8.5 million worth of mortgages on this property. Seven and a half to one company, one million to another, which was an affiliated company, I believe, because the mortgage was placed on the same day. And as a result, you can sure as heck bet whose problem this was. It wasn't the bar horse. Wow. And so if there's an offer that's brought on this property for say $8 million, it's very, very likely that we will be able to negotiate with the lender and say, hey, you know, I know you have 8.5, but here's eight in hand, walk your way. You still, have a, you still have a contract with the borrower. You still have a commitment. You can still pursue them beyond the security. Remember, a mortgage is just a security for a contract. The contract still exists if the mortgage security isn't sufficient to account for the needs of the con contract. You can still go after them, but right now, your security is worth only 8 million, not anymore. So take your security, go your own separate way because you can't see more than that, and then sue him for the remaining 500,000 bucks. Done. Okay, got it. So, okay, so going back to that example, let's say the, the property is worth a million bucks now. I have a million dollars worth of mortgages. And let's say I am proactive and I either put the house for sale or I wait and then the private forces me to put the, the house for sale. Like, so for example, am I right to assume, first of all, they can force me to put it for sale after the 37 days or whatever? Yes. Okay. Well, they, they, they don't force you to put it for sale. They'll they put it for sale. It for sale. Got it. So then I put it up for sale. They put it up for sale and it sells for 950 and after realtor fees, call it and a bunch of stuff. Let's call it 900 clean. 800 goes to, let's assume round numbers, 800 goes to pay off the bank and there's $100,000 left. So are you saying at this point, I'm trying to negotiate the damages or it's at the no, mercy of- No, no, you wouldn't negotiate it then, then. You would, so there's two different points of negotiation. First, there's the negotiation point when you realize you're in trouble before the power of sale even institutes. So for instance, in the example that you say, where they say, hey, we're not renewing the mortgage. That's a really good time to call the lender and say, look, I, I know you're not renewing the mortgage, but there's no mortgages out there. And so your option is to power of sale this thing. But if we do, you're only going to get the market price. So rather than go through all that extra cost, will you agree to allow me to put it up, see what we can net, and then you can make a decision as to whether or not you're ready to release me or ultimately permit the sale? Because they can still release the security still with more owing. That's a negotiation. And then once the money comes in and they realize that they're about to take a haircut, you can basically say, look, I'm ready to do this now. I'm ready to sign this agreement, but you have to let me walk away. You're gonna take a $50,000 hit, but we all go our own ways and that's it. Sucks for me too. I lost $400,000 in equity. Are you good? They may say yes. The other way of dealing with it is to uh, put it up for sale without telling them um, just, in advance, get an offer and say, look, this is the highest and best offer that came in. What the hell do you want me to do here in advance of the power of sale? Um, once they're in the power of sale position, they're gonna face the same decision. Do we wanna take it over by way of foreclosure? Do we wanna take a, do we wanna sell this? Like they, they have their own decisions to make, but all of it is gonna be subject to the reality of the LTV. Got it. Okay, so, okay, so that's, 
helpful. And then I'm assuming at that point, from the perspective of the MIC or the investors within the MIC, they're going to assess whether or not they're going to release them if they feel there's no assets maybe to chase after by way of lawsuit, or if they have assets, maybe they'll pursue them after. I'm assuming that's how they're looking. Right. At the, the only discussion, discussion point is, are we going to release our security? That's the operative issue. Do we release our security against the property? Do we allow this property to sell, given that we haven't been made whole through the security? Okay, so if they say yes, that's one outcome. What happens if they say no? And you can, and you well, don't if, sell. If they say no, then it's as much their problem as anyone else. So they say no. So their charge remains. You still owe them two hundred thousand dollars, but they can't realize on that two hundred thousand dollars. So you're effectively allowed to kick the can down the road as long as you're making payments. So at that point, what happens if you stop making payments? Again, they only have the option of self-help remedies, which is power of sale. That's mm. all. they can sue you and they can pursue you on the commitment which you signed which will allow them to secure a judgment as against your income or anything else, sure. But as regards to the house, they only have security for the value of the property itself. You can put a security on for $15 million, but if it sells for 500,000 bucks, then that is all you are going to realize by virtue of your security. Got it. Now, okay, now I want to, do this exact same exercise, but I want to do it by from the perspective of me, the the lender. Let's say I'm somebody that put money into a MIC, or let's say I'm just directly doing private lending. When what makes sense as the so for example, because there's a lot of people right now who are going to try to not re, they're not going to renew their privates, right? And I guess what makes sense as the first step when you feel you're going to near a default or you're now past the maturity date? Like, how do you handle that as that perspective? The very first thing you do is you request a payout statement from the first mortgagee just to figure out how much is owing there. So you really want to understand how much you're going to actually get. And usually a well-crafted secondary mortgage will allow you to actually have visibility into how much is actually still owing on the first. Uh, After you pull that, then you basically make a decision and you say, should we power of sale this, given that we expect X in the market and there's going to be Y realtor fees and there's going to be the following power of sale costs? Is it worth our while? Is it something where we want to just take over the property ourselves? That's called foreclosure. That's the difference between power of sale and foreclosure. We want to step into their shoes. Maybe it's just a really good property. Maybe, as sometimes happens with private mortgages, it's like I've seen this happen. It's like, okay, you know, I'm ready to raise my kids in this house. Sure, this is a nice house. I, I lent to you on the basis that if this defaulted, this is in the same school district I want and everything else, I'll just take it over. I'll buy out that first mortgage position. I'll take my hit. Done. I'm going to get you out of the house and I'm going to take it over. Could do that. But really, those are your only options. Uh, or you can or you can defer payment. You can backload it. You can basically say, I believe the market is going to bear a higher price for whatever reason in a year. And so I'm ready to re-extend the funds at an atrocious interest rate. I'll build it into the mortgage or I'll take some upfront capital from you, 50,000 bucks now for an extra year. And we'll push the can down the road. But the exact reverse of the scenario doesn't in any way change the fact that the lender is predicated by the value of the property. Okay, that's very helpful. And actually, I do have a question specifically about one thing you said. I know some people that strategically lend on properties that they wouldn't mind taking on, right? Specifically. So uh, just a technical question. If that becomes something that they're um, considering, how is the market value decided on that they're going to take that property over? Well, well, a foreclosure doesn't require a market value. So power of sale requires you to get market value and it requires you to give whatever the value is that doesn't isn't required to pay off the securities over back to the borrower. Foreclosure is a different process. Foreclosure, which is permitted, allows you to simply step into the shoes of the buyer. So technically, there's reasons why this might not work, but technically, if you have a $100,000 mortgage on a million dollar property, you can foreclose instead of power of sale and thereby simply end up with $900,000 worth of equity in your pocket. Back. Mm. We're dealing with a property right now where someone for $130,000 foreclosed. We just went to court yesterday and defended against it. 
um, but they foreclosed on a $730,000 property, $130,000 mortgage. And they hmm. did this because they were dealing with someone with dementia who didn't know what was going on and didn't defend. Oh, wow. Okay. No, but um, you can see why they wanted why they wanted to go that route and not power of sale. Because if they went power of sale, they put thirty thousand dollars in fees above their hundred and thirty. They would take one hundred and sixty, and then the balance would then go back to the purchaser, which is different than stepping into the purchaser's shoes and owning the equity in the property, which is the foreclosure process. Got it. Got it. Now, for the power of sale process, so we know it's the thirty-seven days that you have to wait. How long? 35 is what we're supposed to say. 37 is what's done in order to make sure you meet the strict requirements of the act. But anyways. Right. So let's say we're past that time frame. Um, what is the range that somebody's looking at from the private side as the lender to go through this process and put it to an end? Well, I should, I should stress, I don't do this area of law uh, from a litigation perspective. But generally, it's not very long. Um, three months, you can often get a rid of possession. Okay. Here. Okay. And my last and the, question. The reason for that, the reason for that is because of the default judgment. The reason for that is because it's often indefensible. There's no defense that can be put up to the actual claim that is brought by the lawyer. When they say you're in default, you haven't made payments or the mortgage is over. There's no defense to that. The mortgage is over. Therefore, when they bring a default judgment, there is no defense that can be brought that says this is a trialable issue that will take two years in court. Rather, it's just something where the court says, yeah, huh, done, judgment rendered, and then you can just begin the eviction process. Got it. Got it. So again, th this is the last question again from somebody I know that is running a business like this. So he asked me to ask, uh, what advice, and again, I don't know if this is because it's not your area of expertise, but you do know quite a bit. So I think uh, we'll get something valuable here. What advice would you have or give to private lenders in first or second position when lending in this environment? or any other environment for that matter. Is there any specific legal clause to add to the commitment letters to help speed up collection? No, but what you would want to do at this point is cross collateralize. If you're smart, you're gonna cross collateralize. Can you, you expand on that? Yeah, of course. A mortgage can in fact encumber multiple properties. So it's great that you want this for $200,000, but I know that I'm in a falling market. So also give me some of your cottage. Put this mortgage on your cottage as well. Give me additional equity. That is a requirement. Like what you really need to be doing is a B, what, what smart money is doing right now is they are only lending using conservative estimations as the value. One way of doing that is to simply lend at seven, say 60% LTV. Another way of doing that is by increasing the value of the property that you are actually securing. And the way to do that is to simply add more properties. Are there any other assets you can cross collateralize with, or is it just property? You can, well, you are absolutely allowed to take, um, okay, so there's two different registries in the province of Ontario. One is the land registry, and the second is the personal property security registry. So as an example, when you lease a car, um, or uh, when you finance a car, excuse me, the loan doesn't get registered against your house. It gets registered against the PPSA, the Personal Property Security Registry, which says, hey, there's this asset out there called a car. It's really any asset, any asset at all that is in a home, that is in a property. This asset, this is a car with this VIN number. We have a first charge against that car. There are any other number of other assets that you may not be thinking of, but that are regularly securitized. As an example, assignment of rents. So we get first dibs on the rents that are coming in. Um, income, income stream, bank accounts. We get first dibs on, you can, you can securitize anything. In fact, what most people do just to be blanket is they get what's called the GSA, which is a general security agreement, which says over everything you own, all non-property assets, we actually have an interest, period. So we can go after your bank accounts, we can go after your income streams, we can go after whatever, we can go after it all. And so sure, you can absolutely get a GSA as well to securitize that against other assets that the party may, may own, boats, cars, planes, whatever. Uh, as an example, and I'm just going to throw this name out, Matthew Gibson is the person who I hold in great uh, esteem 
who is out in Hamilton, who does enforcement work all the time, who engages and defends people uh, for this type of stuff. Uh, very well, very much worthwhile looking up Matthew Gibson if you need his help. But certainly if you're having trouble and you're trying to figure out how to navigate the process and figure out which litigator you need, or alternatively, if you need someone who can help you with conveyance and just save them up lenders and negotiating that, it's all in my belly. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Bass, as always. I'm glad to be back on the show. If you found value in this video, please like and subscribe to the channel. This gives me the feedback I need on what kind of content you want to see. For Mark's contact info, please see it in the description below. And if you have any real estate related questions, please schedule a calendar call or text or email me and I'd love to chat real estate. I'll see you in the next one.